Hi there, folks. Welcome to part two of tutorial number four uh, for Poly 399 in uh, fall 2020. So what I've got up here is the kind of tutorial assignment part one, uh, where this is what you would have done last week, where you recode, compute, and then this week we're going to be doing descriptive statistics. So last week you spent some time recoding and computing uh, the uh, variable from the 2011 CES uh, that captured political knowledge. And we showed why we're not using the 2019 uh, Canadian election study for that, just because it's uh, not feasible to get a good um, uh, knowledge measure out of that in a way that is, you know, useful for us <laughs> for the purposes of learning how to get this stuff done. So you would have done that last week. And so what you need to do is to make sure that you're going to access the do file that you had built last week, and we're going to start by using that this week. Um, so here is the second part of the assignment. So you've already recoded those eight variables, and now we're going to do part one. You've already done it, yeah? Yeah. So you're going to want to go and make sure that you've got that variable in your do file. And then part two, this is where we're going to get questions uh, on D2L. So there's a D2L quiz where we're gonna work with that knowledge variable first, then we're gonna work with the most important issue variable from the 2011 CES, and I'll show you why in a minute. Um, and you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you deal with missing data, and I'll show you how to do that. And then I'm gonna show you uh, the 2019 Canadian election study, and we're gonna look at some of the gender questions that they have in there. And so this is why I want you to be sure um, that you've got the do file from part one and that you've got your 2011 and 2019 CES data sets ready to go first. So this is what it looks like uh, when I do it. Part of it. I'm not going to show you the whole thing, uh, but you have skills. You know how to do a lot of this stuff. Okay, so there's data for me. I'm going to go to File, Open Recent, Do Files, and here's my tutorial number four, Do File. So look at this. I built this last week, and I know that uh, I've got my variable set up here. If I wanted to work with that political knowledge variable, all I need to do is select the whole thing. I can click do to make the whole thing run. Poof, there it goes. I can use the keyboard shortcut for PCs. This is going to be control D, I'm pretty sure. For Macs, it's shift the command button and D. So that's just the keyboard shortcut. So if you see me using the keyboard shortcut, that's what I do because it's super fast. So if I were a student in Poly 399 uh, or 691, the first thing I would do is I would go and I would um, make sure that I had my do file here. Uh, and then I would go to D2L and I would answer the first questions. And you can see from this, you've got nine questions that I'm gonna be asking you about this particular variable. Now, uh, just because we're dealing with measures of central tendency, one of the things that you're going to need to know to do is figure out, um, yeah, how to figure out measures of central tendency and measures of dispersion. If you've watched the lecture video, one of the things that's really clear is that you can pick up any number of these from actually looking at the table itself. So you should be able to figure out the mode looking just at the table and the mode is simply the most frequently occurring value or the most frequently occurring response. Here you just look at the percent. You could look at the biggest number or you could look at the biggest percent, but that's where you would get this from. Uh, we can find out the median. The median is the case where uh, the value of the case where 50% of the uh, cases fall above and 50% of the cases fall below. So we're not looking for 50%. We're looking uh, over here. What we're looking for is the cumulative one. And we want to see where that 50% split mark is, where half the cases are above and half the cases are below. And we want the value of that case that's smack in the middle. This is where we need to find the 50%. So again, we can eyeball this from the table as well. But... Like I said, in the video for the lecture, we don't want to calculate uh, mean. I mean, we could technically calculate the mean. We would just have to add up, uh, add all of these up here and then divide by the total number of cases. It's, it's a pain. We don't want to do it that way. We want the computer to do it for you. So we can do a few things. You can just type mean knowledge. And then it gives you the mean and the standard error 
This is not what we want. This is not a standard deviation, right? But it does tell you the mean, gives us the mean there. The better way to do this is a command called summarize. Summarize literally summarizes a variable uh, and status shorthand for this is SU. So you could do summarize knowledge and run that. And here you've got knowledge observation mean standard deviation min and max. This is good. Uh, we can do better though. If you do comma detail, so in Stata, if you put a sometimes, especially if you're looking, if you want to like add options or do extra things like this, usually this is when the comma comes into place. So I'm just literally, this is like summarize knowledge. This is what I'm telling the computer to do. Summarize this variable. Here I'm saying summarize it with more information. And this is what we get. So we get full percentiles, 1, 5, 10, 25, 50 handy for figuring out the median, 75. So I've got my interquartile range right there. Uh, and then I've got the 90th, the 95th and 99th percentile. Here you can got observations. I've got the mean and standard deviation again. I've got thing, don't, I don't really care about these for our purposes. So things I want you to pay attention to is you've got mean and standard deviation there and you've got um, all the percentiles, including your interquartile range there. If you want to learn more about like all the options you can do on a command like summarize, you just do this help state a command and then you put your command in and see what it says. So here it's like summarize. You can see the underline that tells you you just need the first two letters. Summarize your list of variables. It gives you like, and you can say if, you know, uh, another variable is a particular value, you can add a whole bunch of other options. And then here you can see after the comma, you've got options there. Uh, so it's telling us a whole bunch of things that we can do. Here is detail, display, additional statistics. Uh, you can do mean only. I don't recommend that, but it's an option. Um, things along those lines. It tells you all of the different things that you can do in this. And it gives examples of what this would look like. Um, and because economists use Stata, they really like to use automotive examples. And so this is like cars um, that were like made in the United States versus made like elsewhere. Basically, that's what that means. They're desperately boring examples. I think ours are more interesting. Anyway, that's what the help menu looks like for that. So to answer some of the questions, some of those nine questions that, oopsies, you know you've got coming for this part, you've got nine questions there. You're gonna need some measures of central tendency and dispersion. So you know how to get that now by looking at, I would just use the SU command, the summarize command, knowledge and detail. Okay, so that's the first part. Say you've done those nine questions, then you need to go and use uh, CPS 11 underscore one. So we're still using the 2011 Canadian election study. Uh, and so I wanna show you a quick minute why. So here I still have the 2011 election study open because I've been working with that knowledge variable that I made. Uh, and here I'll tab what it looks like. Here it's literally the most important issue to you in a given election. Often in a survey, um, particularly for election surveys, but for other ones too, this is a really easy opening question. Like what's the most important problem facing the country? Uh, what's the most important issue that you think dominates politics, things along those lines. So there's lots of options there. If you're asking yourself, why am I not using from 2019? Well, let me just open up the Canadian election, um, election study from 2019 and show you. So here I'm searching for issue. I can see like 2000, like 2019, the most important issue. This is the variable that I need, I'm just gonna give Stata a minute. Watch how it spins. And spins. And it struggles. And it struggles. and it struggles. It actually can't run the frequency distribution of these open-ended um, 
like this open-ended question of like what's the most important issue facing uh like in the, or in the 2019 election right one of the reasons why is if you're looking at the 2011 data set just up here we're dealing with fewer than 5,000 people compared to 40,000 in um in the 2019 election study. And so when those 40,000 people are sorted into like categories, like a s smaller number of categories, the computer can do okay with it. But for gnarly things like this, or for things that are just kind of all over the place, uh, the computer can't present all of that. So it just says too many values, I'm not gonna run that. If you wanna click on this part, it will actually explain the error for you. And so here it says, error, too many values. You've attempted to string variable. So we know that we're dealing with words here. It takes on more than 65,536 unique values. <laughs> uh, so this is like the knowledge question from uh, 2019 that's open-ended. Um, anything that's open-ended in a survey this size is going to be challenging for us to use in the sense. So basically, this is where the computer's like, I've tapped out. I, I can't. I'm not doing that. So... This is why we go back to 2011. Uh, so I'm gonna just open back up my 2011 data set and go to this part. Okay, so I should have set more off when I'm tapping this one. Here we go. I've got uh, my uh, most important issue in this election, it's first question. Even here you can see it's like, they have a whole bunch of basic information uh, and then they've got, it's literally the first question that gets asked in the 2011 election study. You have to answer four questions using this variable. And the cue that you get here is that you need to be certain to deal with missing data before you answer these questions. So before you even look at the questions in D2L, you have to do some work with this one. And when I say missing data, what you need to do is you need to figure out how you're going to deal with these people who are in the question, but they're not giving you useful information about uh, which issue is the most important issue. And so here you can see you've got these three categories at the bottom. Uh, you've got people who say, none, I don't have an issue. And part of me is like, I don't believe you. Uh, but this cues to me that somebody's just actually not thinking too much about the election, which is fair, but I don't want them in as a result. People who say that they explicitly are prepared to <laughs> say that they don't know, they're not sure, they're not paying attention, uh, of which there are a good number of folks, uh, which is why we need to take care of them. And uh, the people who refuse to answer the question. So what... and. Just, we can just look at some of these here where we've got like others plus multiple responses. So the kind of catch all category, negative politics, uh, the economy consistently comes up, um, taxation issues, including HST, which might not be federal jurisdiction. The environment comes up there, uh, ethics and effectiveness and accountability. I'm not sure what people are saying about majority or minority governments, but anyway, some work has gone into already to kind of like cobble all of these things together in 2011. So I need to figure out how I'm going to deal with these folks. What I would do if it were me is that I would run this CPS 11, CP, CEP, CPS 11 underscore one um, without labels. So this gives me the numbers for all of these categories. And it tells me these last three categories that I don't want, they're 97, 98, and 99. So I'm going to make those missing. I just want to chuck them out for the purposes of this part. Uh, and so what I wanna do, but remember how I don't wanna do this by like changing this data. I don't wanna change that data. So I'm going to make a new variable called issues. It's going to be equal to CPS 11 underscore one. Uh, I'm gonna tab it again. And here you'll notice it looks just like the issues variable without any value labels though. I'm going to recode it so 97, 98, and 99 are missing, uh, which is great. And then if I left it there, you can see that part of me is like, wait, how do I go back and make sure that I put words on these so I know which each of these categories are? Yeah. So if you're having a moment being like, do I have to go and like find all these value labels and type all of that in? That would be terrible. And the answer is no. Uh, I want you to click on CPS 11 over here and then look down at the properties. So it says things like name the label, which is what it tells you, like the substantive thing about the question. Here it's like the most important issue for you this election. 
the type, uh, its format, value label. Yeah. So remember how when you'd be typing out value labels yourself, you'd be like label define one is like quotes the word end quote two is that word so on and so forth. The, that work has already been done and it's been saved. So all we have to do is apply that. Now, if you're like me, you might do it the wrong way first, um, which is what I did today. So I did label values. I don't remember what comes first. So it's my value label issues. Is that how it works? And I ran that and it was like the variable lab is not defined, which is why it's like this in my do file. Oopsies. That I have already been working with label values lab and then tab it and oopsies. Nope, not tab values, tab issues. And there you go. It looks exactly like CPS 11 did. Uh, I've got the same value labels. I have substantive labels on all of these. I just happen to not have missing data in it. You can see I have fewer cases than what I would have before I took care of the missing data up here, right? So I've got like almost 550 folks that have gone. Um, and that's why that shows up here. So now that I've you know dealt with missing data and put the value labels back on, my new issues variable, or most important issue variable, then I can go to D2L and answer those four questions. Um, yeah, about uh, various sorts of things with this particular variable. So that's what you would need to do to set yourself up to be able to answer those questions um, with CPS uh, underscore 11, this part here, oopsies. So this one here, that's how you deal with the missing data. After that, there are three questions that take us back to the 2019 election data set. Uh, and so here's my do file. I just open that, poof, there you go. See how easy it is for me with a do file to just switch between data sets like this. This is why we like do files, super duper easy, okay. Uh, the reason why I want to talk about, uh, this section is about gender variables. So there are, in the 2019 election study, they're starting to reflect uh, the kind of like empirical political sciences, very slow catch up with some more theoretical aspects of how we think about concepts like gender. And so one of the things I want to show you is what the gender variable looks like. That's... Uh, what is it? CPS under 19 underscore gender. So if we just tab that, here you can see that there are uh, more than two categories. So the election study officially is not uh, using this gender as a binary as of 2019, which is good. I think the Americans are still very much solidly like measuring gender on the binary. Uh, but at least in Canada, we've expanded this to three categories. Um, this is not without its problems. And so what they're, what they're saying is they're asking people to identify like they, so they say, are you a man? Are you a woman? Are you a, like a category that's not covered by like men or women? This is not ideal. And for me, I'm looking at this and there are things that are included in like the way that they're labeling the other category. that are really wrong. Like trans status is not gender identity and this is supposed to be a variable that measures gender identity and so like there is still like massive room for improvement on this um two-spiritedness is something that is intimately tied to indigenous identity uh and indigenous culture and so like white folk don't get to have that as a category that's available to, for them for self-identification and so that needs to be carefully taken into account as well and so for me if I'm looking at this category, like at least the the point is that we're not erasing folks who like don't fit into like a gender binary. And this is, I think, the important step forward. I would also say that we still have like massive room for improvement on how this part gets done. Uh, this is not how I do it. When I do the most recent study I fielded has at least four closed ended categories. So people can identify as women, they can identify as men, they can identify as gender fluid and non-binary, and they can identify as something that's not listed there. Now you might be asking yourself, like why not just use an open-ended category for this particular question? 
And I'm hoping simply by looking at like what happened with the political knowledge variable in 2019 and then also what happened with that issues variable as in like uh, we couldn't get it. Like we couldn't even get the election study. We couldn't get the computer to run it, right? Uh, And so there are some technical problems with an open-ended question. Um, My experience with open-ended gender questions in particular, uh, even with an undergraduate student sample at the University of Calgary, is that if I give people a gender identity, like, like, do you identify as a, like, man, as a woman, whatever, if I leave any kind of open-ended option for that, uh, the really unfortunate thing is that people use that as an opportunity to express some really distasteful views. And so the issue is that... um, yeah, like it just gets abused by people who like don't respect various forms of gender identity. So I know for me, this is why I tend to lean a little bit more towards closed-ended categories for a gender question, um, but I would not do these ones. I would, there are better ways to do it. Anyway, um, if you are interested in looking at um, gender and w- like the individual behavior and patterns of that of folks um, outside of the binary, there is an option for you to be able to do this. I would strongly say, though, that if you're going to do it uh, in for your research report, you have to choose other indicators that are in the campaign period survey, and I'll show you why in a minute. It has to do with the other questions uh, that get asked um, in the uh, asked to measure gender in the uh, election study later on in the data set. So what I want you to run, and these are variables, you're going to be working with PES 19 feminine. This is the variable that the questions on D2L are, are based on, but I also want to show you what the masculine variable looks like too. So these particular variables are trying to uh, figure out what's actually driving a lot of uh, gendered behavior that we see in uh Behavior is not necessarily the word, but we're trying to capture more of what's going on in people's heads that might help us better understand when we see gendered phenomenon and when we see differences across gender groups. And so these questions ask um, how masculine or feminine people identify themselves as on a zero to 100 scale, where zero is like not feminine at all and 100 is 100, like completely feminine, uh, or zero would be not masculine at all, or 100 would be 100% masculine. So one thing to highlight in terms of uh, what I'm doing with my state of syntax, if I do tab one, this lets me run frequency distributions of a list of variables um, one after another. So I'm tabbing them one at a time. So I'm just going to run both of these variables at the same time here. And I should have set more off that is a lesson learned set more off okay so here we are uh the first one is the pes19 feminine so how much do you identify as feminine on a scale from zero to 100 where zero means like not at all and 100 percent means a lot now why would we be asking this this way like what would this variable get us in theory um that we wouldn't be able to get just by looking at, say, gendered categories. And this is pulling a little bit on social psychology, but it's trying to get at the idea of how rigid people see um, their own gender, or how rigid they see their own gender identity. And so for folks who are saying, uh, who particularly who identify in like uh, binary categories of like women and men, if we have like, women who are saying I'm 0% masculine and 100% feminine, and for men who are saying I'm 0% feminine and 100% masculine, what we're starting to see is that they've got some pretty um, rigid and often pretty sexist views about how this translates into politics as well. Whereas folks who are prepared to like say something other than 0 and 100 uh, tend to have like their, their actions and their thoughts, like it actually matters it's politically relevant. Like it matters how they're evaluating politicians. It matters the kinds of issues they prioritize. It changes, uh, or there are differences rather in um, the issue positions that they take in things. And so, what I want you to take a look at, because we're looking at averages and central tendency and things along those lines for these variables, is um, because they're in the post-election survey. You can see that there are like we don't have forty thousand folks anymore. We've got fewer than five 
uh, 5,000. You can see I don't have missing data on this. I don't have a don't know or refused or anything. Like they exist, they're just not showing up in the frequency distribution. Uh, and you can see this is, the first one is this feminine. Like the number of people who are choosing zero uh, is like not, like it's, you can see that like they cluster on like respondents, responses cluster on things like zero, 10, uh, we get a kind of like a little bit muddiness in the middle. You get maybe some at 50, not even 50. Look at that. 51 beats 50. Interesting. Uh, so you can see interesting clusters and things. Uh, and you've got some people pulling up to zero and one, certainly, or zero and 100. Uh, but you've got this, it's an interesting distribution for sure. Uh, you can see the similar sorts of things, just eyeballing the table for the masculine question. Now, Another way to look at this, because we're looking at shapes of distributions, is if you wanted to just look at the shape of a distribution uh, for one of these variables, you can run something called a histogram. Uh, so I'm just going to do this for the feminine question. Poop. There we are. And so this, it tells you, like it gives you a visual representation of what's going on here. So this is for the whole sample, and you'll notice it's not normally distributed. You can see there's like the most common responses are kind of at the opposite ends, the zeros and the 100s, but we've got some variation in the middle. Uh, similarly, if you wanted to do this for the masculine question, uh, I will show you what that looks like too. You can cut down histogram to just HISD or HIST histogram. Uh, and like perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, because there are more women in the sample, like zero pops a little bit more up there too. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, how, what do you need to know to be able to do, like answer these four questions or these three questions that are coming up? Uh, what bits of stated do you need to know? There's a couple of things that you could do. Um, so one of the things that you can do is you can run a frequency distribution, and, but you can tell the computer, but only do it if this other variable equals a certain value. And so here I'm going to tab my gender category again. And if I do this, CPS19 underscore gender no label, that tells me the numbers that are associated with each category. So they've got one, two, and three, and I know this matches onto men, women, and um, gender fluid and non-binary folks. Okay, so if I wanted to know what these looked like just for women um, in this group there, um, I could just say tab one at a time, the feminine question, the masculine question, if this particular variable equals two. Now here you'll note in this context, you need a double equal sign. Stata is big on this. If you're doing any of these if statements in Stata, you need a double equals. So. I have my double equals. Uh, if I didn't have that, here's what I would get. It would say invalid syntax. And if you click on this to see, like, it's not super useful. Like, it's not telling me what mistake I've made. In this context, I can I know it's because I need a double zero. And so if I put the double zero in, then I've got, uh, I should have done this set more off again. Okay. So here I've got the same things just for women. So you can see I've got a smaller number of cases. And if I'm looking at the feminine question again, like the proportion of women who are saying that they're 0% feminine is um, pretty small. And you can see I've got like really small numbers here. Uh, if I'm looking at the full distribution, like I'm starting to get bigger numbers. And then like I've got a category there. So one thing that we can do is we can do histogram PES 19, oopsies, 19 feminine underscore one. Um, if CPS 19 gender double equals two. So here we can just draw a picture of it and you can see it's skewed to one side. Um, now, if I were to do this histogram PES, if I was going to look at masculinity, uh, masculine underscore one if CPS 19 underscore gender is also two. And I can tell I've got a typo there. Okay, I think that's all correct. Yeah, 
and you can see it skewed to the other way. So this is women, like, and the most common, yeah, you can see the shape of the distribution. It's, it's, it's skewed. Uh, similar sorts of things happens if you run this for um, men as well. Uh, what I want to show is just quickly um, what this looks like for, I actually won't do the histograms. What I want to show you is what the, the frequency distributions look like for um, the gender fluid non-binary group. Okay. So right out of the gate, you can see that by the time we get to the post-election survey, we've gone from almost 300 respondents who fit into this category to a very small number. And this is why for your research reports, you're, this is too small for us to be able to do the kind of statistical analysis that um, we need to, to answer, to address a hypothesis. And so this is why if you wanted to look at um, gender fluid and non-binary folks for your research report, choose something from the campaign period survey. We're in the post-election survey here and like our, our numbers are just too small. Another thing to note right away is that like, because we only have 31 folks, they're not choosing every option. Like we don't have a zero through, we have zero through 100, like we've got the full range, but we're missing. Like there are just numbers that folks haven't chosen in part because there's, there's, you know, we have too few in the sample, but it looks, I mean, that's the, the feminine one. And then the masculine one is, is pretty similar, right? And what's interesting is that like here, we don't even have the full range. So nobody in of the 32 folks in the gender fluid non-binary categories is saying that they're 100% masculine, right? Um, so if I did histogram of P... 19 minus world one if CPS 19 gender is three. So you can see we've got different bins and things. Uh, and the, the shape is still like, uh, it's still like not the, um, it's an interesting distribution. Anyway, uh, the shape of these distributions is certainly telling us a lot of information about how people are answering those questions. Now, if I wanted to, um, do that summarize command just to be able to get some information about like say mean and standard deviation. I could do it this way. This is the undetailed one. It's giving me the full observation and the mean standard deviation. So like the standard deviations are pretty big. Like it's basically 35 or 36 like units on that zero to 100 scale. So that tells me that I've got a pretty dispersed, um, dispersed variable. But what if I wanted to run these so that I had a version of this for every uh, closed ended gender group. Here's how you can do it. You could do like summarize these variables if this variable equals a certain value, but then you'd have to do it like one at a time, right? And if I wanted to look at them all together, um, how would I go about doing that? This is the code that you need. It's this command that says, by sort a variable name, do this thing. So this is like saying, sort and by the gender groups, summarize this particular variable. And honestly, this one too. Okay. So by sort CPS19 underscore gender gets, I want the feminine and the masculine question. And this is what we get. So here it will tell you like the category that has a one. These are the folks who identify as men. They're mean on the uh, on the feminine question and they're mean on the masculine question. Uh, you've got it for people who identify as women. They're mean on the feminine question. They're mean on the masculine question. And then for folks in the gender fluid non-binary group, um, they're mean on the feminine question and they're mean on the masculine question. So there's that. And we've already covered what it means to do like summarize comma detail. And so at some point you may want to run a version of this as well, where you're getting actually the detailed, the detailed response uh, or the detailed summary for that particular question. But pretty straightforward. A couple of things I want you to take away from this is that if you build clean do files like this, it's really easy to come back to work that you've already done and then even make small edits to be able to pick up and do more work with it. Uh, it makes it easy to switch between election studies because you'll have the file path just there and then you've got that work there. 
Uh, and a uh, couple of things to note, depending on what you want to do, uh, the 2019 Canadian election study isn't great because it's so big. Like it's one of these things where the benefit of being, um, for say the benefit for having like a larger number of cases that we actually can get some information about, um, people who identify in say, uh, gender categories beyond this, the binary of women and men, which is great. Uh, the drawback is that for questions that are open-ended where you're going to get, um, like a whole host of responses, like political knowledge, like what's the most important issue, uh, the current format that we've got it in is really kind of unwieldy, but still, this is what my do file looks like for tutorial assignment that you need to do. This part is for the knowledge questions. This part is for the issues question. And I've been playing around with a lot of this. I wouldn't even need all of this for, for the gender questions, but th that gives me a lot of the content that I need there. All right, so over to you. Uh, you need to make sure that you go over to D2L uh, and building on the work that you did this week, you'll answer the questions that are part of the D2L quiz for tutorial assignment number four that are up on D2L now.